This is Annie Fox for Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. My guest today is Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative journalist Katherine Ellison, author of Buzz, A Year of Paying Attention. Today's show, ADD, ADHD, Paying Attention to Attention Disorders. Today's guest is Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative journalist Catherine Ellison, veteran foreign correspondent and writing consultant. Catherine is the mother of two sons and the author of four books, including The Mommy Brain, How Motherhood Makes Us Smarter, and her new memoir, Buzz, A Year of Paying Attention. Catherine Ellison gives all she's got to every professional assignment. You don't win a Pulitzer Prize for phoning it in. One day she was driving on the freeway late for a meeting with a new client when her 12-year-old son Buzz, who's got ADHD, had yet another major meltdown. Catherine's 60 mile per hour response was equally over the top. That's when she decided it was time to put on the brakes, back burner all other career plans, and spend a year paying attention to Buzz and his diagnosis while chronicling her findings and her feelings. In the process, Catherine discovered that she too has ADHD, which explains so much about the challenges she faced as a journalist and a mom. Catherine also researched and investigated a wide range of treatments currently available to exhausted, loving parents like herself. All those moms and dads who desperately want to help kids with attention deficit disorders find ways to get more control over their behavior so they can be happier and more successful in the classroom and beyond. Hi, Kathy. Welcome to Family Confidential. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I am delighted that you're here. And this book, Buzz, A Year of Paying Attention, is pretty hot because I meet parents all the time and talk to them and get email from them about these diagnoses they're getting from their kids, ADD, ADHD. And when I read your book, I was delighted to have a more personal, in-depth view of a parent's experience. So tell me, did you name your son Buzz because he zips around a lot, or is this kind of a name that a pseudonym you put on him because of the book? Yes, it's a at the latter. Yes and yes. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> yes and yes. He does have this kind of electric jolt way of affecting me, my attention span. He's very provocative, and so he's sort of like this, you know, alarm clock all the time. He does tend to interrupt me like an electric jolt often. I also pick the name just to give him a little bit of privacy, so people can't Google him. So it's not a nickname from the family. No, that we use all the time? Right. No, I picked it specifically for this book. Okay. You're calling it a year of paying attention, which I think is a great subtitle when you're talking about attention deficit disorder. But paying attention is something that all parents ought to do. And so how was this year of paying attention different from your other years of paying attention to your children as they grow up? Of course, all parents ought to do it. But we're more distracted than ever. So many of us are working a job, if not two jobs, in addition to parenting. We're also, our society just is increasingly eroding our attention with all the different data that's coming at us. So I think it's harder and harder for parents to give the kind of attention to their kids that their kids need. Now, of course, parents in other generations, I don't think, paid quite as much as we're paying. Right. We tend to take parenting a lot more seriously than our parents did. But at the same time, the way that we tune into our children can often be affected by so many things in society, and we can easily be in denial about just how much we're really hearing and seeing what's going on. For me, I had to be sort of shocked into being drawn back to paying good quality attention to what was going on with my family when I realized that we were just having conflicts all the time. Something was going really wrong. Was there a specific blow up that made you aware that there had been a lot of these kinds of blow ups going on? Well, sure. I start the book with something that actually did happen on the freeway. We were in the car and having a terrible fight. And we being my son, my two sons were in the car and they were fighting with each other and I was fighting with them. And it was pretty typical. And but I stopped 
and later found myself writing about it. And for me, all my life, writing about things has been a way of focusing my attention on things that maybe I don't see at the time. When I write things, all of a sudden I'll be writing some memory that I hadn't focused on. And it's as if my subconscious is trying to get me a message. And that's what happened when I just sat down and wrote about this freeway fight. I could tell that I was reacting in a totally wrong way to his being provocative. What were you doing? Something had I to mean, change. I mean, you were just trying to drive, but what were I you? was trying to drive, but as I was writing about it afterwards, I could tell how much my mind was just going off on tangents. There he was sitting, telling me that he wanted caffeine, he wanted Coca-Cola, which was a ridiculous request because we were late, you know, driving to my parents' house where I was going to drop them and go off and do some work, right? He wanted to stop for a coffee break. Right. So, okay, okay. Right. A lot of us with this condition definitely need caffeine stimulation. And at the time, Buzz was really, really interested in, in having Cokes and coffee. And I think he was telling me that he needed more stimulation than he, he was getting. But I was late for one thing. I was, once again, I'd gotten us into a position where it was very stressful. I had planned four things that three of which I probably shouldn't have been doing. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I wasn't going to have time to even say hello to my parents who lived an hour away. Because this is of the, a drive by dropping the kids off? Right. I was okay. going to drop the kids off and then go right help this billionaire in Silicon Valley write a speech, which was part of the consulting work that I was doing. Was it a speech about being a calm folk? No. <laughs> it was a speech about climate change. Oh, okay. At the time, important. it was very important. Yeah. Very important. And I'm very freaked out about climate change, and it mostly has to do with my kids. But at the same time as I was worrying about their lives 20 years from now, I was sort of letting the quality of all of our lives slip, mm -hmm. and I couldn't figure out why that was happening. Albert Einstein has this great quote about no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. Mm -hmm. I realized I had to really look at what was going on with my consciousness and change that in a fundamental way before I was going to be able to be available to my children. How old were the boys at that point? At that time, they were 12 and 9. So you wrote about this experience, taking an external point of view as writers can, and observe yourself in the scene. And what did you discover that you could do about how distracted you were being with your kids? Well, the main thing I needed to do, and somebody else actually, a neuroscientist friend of mine, said it in very simple terms, which kind of was another eye-opener for me. He said, you just have to be calm. And <gasps> Let's say that again. <laughs> it sounds so simple. You just have to be no, you just have to be calm. And he said it in the middle of an interview in which I was kind of frantically peppering him with questions, and for some reason I was able to hear it in a way that I hadn't really considered it but before. But you know, Kathy, people give that advice to each other all the time. Calm down, take relax, a take a chill pill, all right. that stuff. But the doing of it. Right is often in contrast with the simplicity of the notion. And even if you say, yeah, that would be a good idea. Yeah. How do you actually do that? Well, I realized it was going to take a lot more effort than just taking a breath. Mm -hmm. I had gotten a contract to write a book about plastic pollution. And I was all prepared to write this big book about plastic pollution and run off to China and Europe and do all this reporting about this thing that's quite important. But I decided that instead of spending the year that way, I would zero in on trying to become more calm and figure out just what that would mean, how I could bring more calm to my family. There's a million different techniques out there. Calm is something that a lot of people are seeking these days. I just made it my business to try to figure out for a person who's been diagnosed with ADHD, which both my son and I have been, what are the best available treatments? What makes the most sense? And what is most effective? I set out about trying meditation, neurofeedback. At one point, I had my brain scanned by a doctor in Southern California who says that he can spot ADHD on your brain scan and tell you exactly what to do. Do you believe that? Um, that was an interesting chapter. It's Dr. Daniel Amen, and he's a best-selling author and a wonderful man. I think he's a terrific guy and a really good clinician. His practice of saying that he can diagnose disorders from a brain scan is very controversial. And from what I understand from more mainstream psychiatrists, the technology isn't quite ready for prime time. But Dr. Amen 
aside from these very powerful props that he can use, is a great doctor. At the same time, he takes a technique that maybe can be a little bit misleading. So that was a very interesting experience. A couple of minutes ago, you kind of glossed over and you said, well, my son and I had the diagnosis of ADHD. Now, at the beginning of your book, and you're talking about this uh, freeway caffeine withdrawal explosion, had you already at that point gotten a diagnosis for him? Yes. And how about for you yourself? Yes. You knew what you were dealing with, at least on paper. And how were you helping him and yourself knowing at that point? Well, we'd actually tried a lot of things okay, before then. Okay, what did then. you try? Yeah, okay, so he got diagnosed at nine, at age nine. Was that a surprise to you? It wasn't that much of a surprise by then, because we could tell he never was your stereotypical average child. He was very high maintenance, very high intensity from the day he was born. And you hear that a lot. The child never sleeps through the night. He's very sensitive. All these things seem to go together with the diagnosis. But by age nine, he was really having so much trouble at school that we took him to a psychologist who diagnosed him and immediately wanted to get us a prescription for medication. We resisted it at that point. And what what was your thinking about that? I was extremely, both of us were Mm -hmm. extremely opposed to medication. We'd heard so much on the news about how children were supposedly getting heart attacks from it, that it turned them into quote-unquote zombies, and that possibly it was going to cause depression. There's a lot of scare stories out there, and we believed all of them. I was very adamant against medication. Okay, so you were dealing with the ADHD without meds. Right. We even took him to a program at the University of California at San Francisco, a nine-month program where we went on weeknights to learn organizational skills, and the parents all prepared their reward charts in one room while the children all supposedly learned tips to keep calm in the next room. Supposedly? Yeah, <laughs> supposedly a lot of yelling because it story. didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, my, and my reward charts were just a mess. I mean, the other parents were coming in with these gorgeous reward charts, the uh-huh. Excel spreadsheets and... Mine were scrawled on the back of school handouts. and Did you try to implement that system at home? Of course, of and course. Did it we work? tried everything. No, it kind of made things worse. This is one of the problems, Annie. It's like ADHD is so hereditary that if your child has it, there's statistically up to a 40% chance that you gave it to them and that you have it too. We're finding more and more about it. Uh, just today, there was a new Lancet study released showing a difference in the chromosomes. So... It's clearly one of the most hereditary disorders there is. Yeah. And so, but not all the parents in our class, of course, shared it with their children, but I definitely do. And Not the ones with the neat charts. No, <laughs> no. Okay. But for, th- there's so many parents like that. There's millions, literally millions of parents in that position. They're disorganized and their child is disorganized and struggling. Well, you'd wonder, you know, the old apple doesn't fall far from the tree thing. So is it nurture or nature, a combination of both? What do you think? I think it's a combination, but you Mm -hmm. both start out with this kind of handicap. Mm -hmm. But it's a little bit like the blind leading the blind because the parent is in the position of supposedly having to provide the structure and the consistency. And the parent might be just coping with those things themselves. Now, early on in the book, you have this passage that is kind of very hopeful in which you're talking about the incredible transformation in Buzz's behavior when you do put him on some medication. Before I ask you to read that passage, I want to ask what got you from the absolutely no, we're not going there, we don't want our kid to turn into a quote-unquote zombie, (laughs) to yeah, let's try this. I held out for months, and so did my husband. I mean, we really, really held out. But things got worse and worse in our house and for Buzz at school. He basically lost all his friends, which was because he couldn't get it together with the social skills to keep up a friendship. And that was really hard for us to watch. Mm -hmm. His teachers were just giving him negative feedback all the time. We knew we had to do something more than the reward charts. We'd taken him to therapists. We felt that we'd tried all these other things. My mother finally responded to my anguished calls every weeknight by connecting me with her brother, who's my dear uncle, who's a child psychiatrist. And he talked to us on the phone one one morning. We were just distraught for an hour. And he said, it's just imperative that you try this. These medications are safe. They've been in use for decades. You owe it to your son to give it a try because he's in such bad shape. 
Okay, so now I'm going to ask you to read the passage in the book, if you wouldn't mind, and uh, tell us what happened after you started giving Buzz these medications. Buzz took his methylphenidate, which is the pharmaceutical name for the stimulants, for less than a week before amazing things started happening. He put aside the Lakers jersey, gold chain, and sunglasses he'd been wearing. Somewhere in his closet, he discovered a neat white polo shirt, which became the keynote of his new school day attire. Over the next couple of weeks, his meltdown sharply declined. He stopped listening to rap. Two of his teachers called, unsolicited, to express their delight about his newfound focus. He smiled more often. Jack and I had feared that he might develop facial tics, but instead, all the weird things that were going on before, the leaping eyebrows, shrugging shoulders, jerking lips, melted away. I never imagined things could be this much better. Jack and I shook our heads at each other, mystified, as we watched Buzz knuckling down to his homework. He brushed aside my questions about the how the pill made him feel, yet didn't once object to taking it, and once even said, I think it makes me less impulsive. Meanwhile, I watched him happily taking in the world's new responses to his changed behavior. I was just about ready to write ads for Concerta. Wow. Uh, <laughs> That's how I felt too. <laughs> amazing. And I know it's probably in the first... 30 pages of the book, and there's a whole bunch that happens after that. So how long did this halcyon period last, and what happened? Well, Buzz stayed on the meds for that year, and the fact that he was on the meds, and this was the year right around when I started doing the book, Mm -hmm. not coincidentally, because I think that I had my brain full just coping with just trying to survive each day before then. So it gave me in him a little bit more mental space to just kind of reflect on what uh, was going on. So that was all really valuable. Some calm, huh? Yeah. Maybe some calm. Absolutely. And I think it did make him less impulsive. But I think a lot of mainstream researchers will admit today that you can't rely on the meds alone. You, You simply can't. Once you stop taking them, they stop having effect. And for Buzz, also, there was a question of side effects that he couldn't seem to shake. He had uh, real sleeping problems. That was a major problem. But during those few months, he did make a lot of great progress. He made a wonderful friend who is still his friend today. And he had the experience of having teachers smile at him. Wow. It's pretty huge. It's pretty huge. So I really had to change my whole attitude. And one thing that happened that I describe in the book that was really painful is that until then, one of the things that we were trying, the non-med approach, was to get him a tutor, a local tutor who was really wonderful and had a great reputation and seemed to be helping him, but not stopping any of the terrible situation that I was describing before. She was helping with academic organization, skills and... Yeah, and she was talking to my husband and me a lot and Mm -hmm. trying to help us deal with them. But when I told her that we were trying the meds just to see if they would help him, she said, I don't work with kids who are drugged, and she dropped him as a client. Yeah, it it was really a blow. I was very surprised. You know, I had definitely shared her view about how terrible meds were, but one of the things I was able to do in the next few months that followed was really research some of those claims about the heart attacks, about the depression, about the zombies. It's very interesting when you look closely at where some of that information is coming from and how it's gotten distorted in the news. And there's one doctor in particular, Dr. Peter Bregan, who's written books like Talking Back to Ritalin, where he assembles a lot of the research and characterizes it in a way that is often not accurate. I interviewed a lot of the researchers who were actually doing some of these studies that were getting bandied around. And just to give you one example, there was a report that the stimulants lead to depression in kids. And I talked to the researcher of the study. The study involved rats. The rats were injected with methylphenidate in much higher doses than ever would be given to kids. And by injecting them, it had a much different effect than taking a pill once a day. So by the time we finished the interview, he was conceding that I mean, it would be a huge stretch to say that it causes depression. Had he been aware of the distortions people had done with his research findings? Yeah, I think a little bit. But it's in a tough position. I mean, the meds should be studied. Definitely there should be research. And you can't use humans as guinea pigs, right? So we use rats, and rats can teach us a lot. 
But I think in this case, the conditions weren't at all comparable. And there was another study that came out that supposedly linked them to being a carcinogen. And when I looked at it, it was this tiny preliminary study from Texas that the FDA actually investigated and found that the research methods were really bad. And then there was this huge German study that came afterwards that showed that it wasn't true. Well, this is so confusing for parents, I'm sure. I mean, you're a journalist. You have the wherewithal, the patience, the persistence to investigate so deeply to find out what is true and what isn't. And parents who, for whatever reason, can't do that are... I'm sure mightily confused when they get this diagnosis for their child and they want to help, of course. Right. Your family's in crisis and you're expected to be a professional investigative journalist, basically. And you have these terrible claims coming at you and you're freaked out, basically. You don't want to harm your kid. Yeah, my child is going to be depressed. My child is going to have cancer. Which is worse. (laughs) Meanwhile, my child has no friends and is failing in school and is getting constant negative feedback. It's an absolutely impossible situation for a parent. I really do believe that. There's what I describe as the ADHD industrial complex out there, which is not only the pharmaceutical industry, which only in the United States and New Zealand can advertise directly to the consumer and does with abandon, but also this enormous parallel industry of quote-unquote alternative treatments, some of which are just complete waste of time and money. People spend thousands of dollars on dolphin-assisted therapy because they're so desperate. You know, I mean, tell me about that. I love dolphins. <laughs> tell me what? How can a dolphin is, help? <laughs> because I have endless curiosity and, uh-huh. and, and do I'm able to do. With the dolphins is that is that yeah part of the therapy? If you look into, I wrote a I'm whole sure story. It's totally calming. Yeah. Well, but, no. Here's the thing. I wrote a whole story on this for the Washington Post. It's very popular among the autism parents because. You get a desperate parent, a child who is in this kind of deep trouble, and they've tried everything else that hasn't worked, and they hear about this magical experience swimming with dolphins. So they'll go to Florida, or there's just dozens of other centers all around the world where they have tame dolphins that you can swim with, and have this experience, which is a lot of fun, a bonding experience for the Mm -hmm. parents. They take a trip together. The child gets all this attention. One researcher said it's like giving the child M&Ms. But you might as well give the child M&Ms, take them out for pizza. But the problem is that with each new therapy, and in our information age, parents are absolutely bombarded with these alternatives that are supposedly going to be this magic cure for your child. And you have a very desperate, vulnerable market of people that are exposed to infinite varieties of costly treatments. It's a crazy time we're living in. And the expectation and the hope builds up and you try it and and maybe there's a placebo effect for a little while and things get better and then you're plummeted down into despair again when really nothing has changed. I think that's pretty correct, yeah. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. You say that the meds alone don't work. Well, here's the thing. There's an enormous study that was sponsored by the federal government that that examined different therapies for ADHD over many years following a group of hundreds of children. And the first thing they found out were that meds combined with behavioral therapy was the best way to go, the most effective treatment. If you had to choose, meds alone were more effective. But then they did a follow-up study just like three years afterwards that showed that the long-term outcomes for kids who relied on medication alone were no different from those who didn't. Now, part of this is because if you're just doing meds, what usually happens in this country, I think probably the most common intervention for kids with ADHD is that a pediatrician will prescribe stimulant medications and not give much follow-through and not have much of an evaluation. So if there's side effects, the kids drop out. They stop taking the meds. The average time for kids to be on stimulant medications is less than 13 months. So one of the problems is that people don't stay on them. But it looks like even if they stay on them, sometimes they decrease in effect. They aren't a good strategy all by themselves. If the child stays on them, and for whatever reason, after the average 13-month period goes off them, what kind of manifestation of symptoms do you see after that time period? Because it sounds like what you're describing in Buzz's case was that it gave you guys a period of calm, that he had developed enough focus and 
had social and academic success so that he had made a friend and that he had, for maybe for the first time, teachers smiling at him and giving right. him positive reinforcement. Which was huge. It is huge, and I yeah. don't want to at all minimize that. So I'm wondering, after the period of taking the meds, he has a sense of what is possible? That's right. I think it was really helpful, and I don't regret for a minute that we did do that. He himself didn't want to continue, and you can't force them down, you know. Was he having side effects? Yeah, he was having sleep issues. Sleep issues. Plus, a lot of kids simply don't like the thought that they have to take a pill to make them normal. I mean, they just resist that. What do you think about that? What is normal? There's no normal. Right. <laughs> Our brains are so various and infinitely different that you just can't say that. Mm -hmm. But kids don't know that. And they feel stigmatized, and they feel like there's something wrong with them. And I don't, I don't think it's very hard to get around that idea. So there was that. But I also do think that it was affecting his sleep. One thing that has come through in the research is that there are effects on height. And once he stopped taking the meds, coincidence or not, he had a growth spurt, which really improved his self-confidence. So yes, that experience of a year helped give him the feeling of a different kind of person, a person with more self-control. But once you stop taking the meds, you still have the self-control problem. They're not a cure. They last as long as they're in your bloodstream. So after that, we looked for something that would be more lasting, or if possibly we could find them. And the two things that I thought were most promising in that effect were, A, our family dynamic had to change, and that took some real work. And you put a lot of work in personally. Yeah, which Brain was great. Scan. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great benefit. I mean, I had to face the fact that I was in denial about the way that I was parenting too. I mean, I basically thought that I was doing things pretty right and he was the problem. Mm -hmm. And I didn't look at it that it was a dynamic, that not just him, but me, my husband, his brother. So in one chapter of the book, I really look closely at how everybody in the family was reacting to him and, and behaving. And we all had to take responsibility for our share in it, a process that continues today. <laughs> well, as it should in every conscious family. I mean, yeah. the culture, the attitude, the feeling in the family is fragile. But if a kid has a diagnosis, then it's very easy to say, he's the problem. He's the problem. Right. Boy, things would be so great if right. he would just change. Why am I the victim? He's the perpetrator and I'm the victim. Which brings up a question that I get often from kids who email me, when there is a sibling who seems to be drawing all the attention in the family for whatever reason. Right. And the kid who writes to me is the one who says, my brother acts out all the time. I'm the good kid, and yet nobody pays attention to me. Nobody. Right. And so how did you manage that with your younger son and that dynamic there? That's definitely a big part of the book because I was very afraid for my younger son's safety because... Buzz was so incredibly jealous of him from the time that he was born. I think Buzz could tell that his brother was a much easier baby from the start. I talked to one mother who called her younger daughter her angel who was sent from heaven to help her. Ooh. You know, She'd call her that in front of the older one? Yeah, and oh, so the yes. older one pushed her out the window to see if he, she could fly. <gasps> oh, <my. laughs> yeah, he was three at the time. I hope there was something soft to She land was on fine. Okay, she good. was fine. But that could easily have ended much worse. A parent has to be so conscious. But if you're in that situation, you're exhausted, you're fried, you're in a crisis, you sometimes don't even realize what you're saying. And sometimes you're so angry at the child who's causing you problems that you're also not that conscious. So in your family, with the dynamic between these two brothers, how did that change? as you describe it from the opening scene, as pretty combative. Right. I really had to pay attention and focus on what was going on there and why, and be very, very strict with myself about what kind of attention I was showing to each of my boys. And I realized that it's not fair at all, obviously, to typecast them as the, you know, the good one and the bad one, which we so easily unconsciously do. And when I really looked closely, I could see that my younger son had evolved in a way that he'd learned how to provoke Buzz and just to do little surreptitious things where nobody would see those. Under the but, radar. Right. But everybody would see the way Buzz reacted. Mm -hmm. and hey, it, I didn't do anything. Right, I know. Like Bart Simpson. <laughs> exactly. <I yeah>. <laughs> I'm guessing your kids are pretty intelligent and that you could actually talk to them. They were of the age. 
that you could point out what you had come to realize about their dynamic? Yeah, it's been a hard road in many ways, but I think that they have a an unusual gift now, which is we talk all the time about what their brains are like. For me, having been diagnosed with ADHD at age 50, I think that I would have liked to have known more about how my brain worked at a younger age, because you really can start thinking in terms of the kinds of strategies that will help you succeed. Like I said before, everybody's brain is different. We all have our deficits, but figuring out your strong points and your weak points around this age is pretty good. How long in time has it been since you completed writing this book? And can you give us an update? Well, it's been a year in the time since Buzz went to a private school, which I end the book with him going to a private school and being very hopeful about the private school because there were six kids to a class and it really advertised itself as having this innovative approach. It wasn't quite as innovative as it built itself. And Buzz also needed to mature a lot more during that year. So it wasn't a completely wonderful experience. And at the end of that year, he was suspended a couple of times and we put him back in public school. Ironically, the public school has ended up having a lot more intelligence support. I guess maybe because it's bigger, it's been around more, it has resources in a way to deal with issues like this. Mm -hmm. So I've been very pleasantly surprised at the way that teachers really get him in a way that they didn't, at the, they were a lot more judgmental at the private school, which was a real surprise. It is a surprise. Mm -hmm. So how's he doing? He's in 10th grade now? He's in 10th grade. There's been a lot of great progress, knock wood. Um, he got a job over the summer as a tennis instructor, uh, mm. you know, a junior tennis instructor uh -huh. for little kids. And any little kid that's not his brother, he adores. And he's gotten good at tennis. And I should definitely say that finding a child's passion is one of the best things that a parent can help with. Because for very intense, high-maintenance people like this, if you find your passion early in life, it's a total blessing. And also just to find an area where he can be praised and feel good about himself has been so important. As a 10th grader in high school, I'm thinking there is an awful lot of pressure socially even to be involved in social media. Talk mm -hmm. about distractions, mm -hmm. Facebook, uh, texting, all that stuff. For a typical kid who doesn't have these attention deficit challenges, right. it's incredibly distracting. How does... Buzz manage that lore into the social media world? Well, he's pretty into it. You know, it's, it's a great lore. One of the best experiences I had in public school, in middle school, was when my son got in a fight with another kid who was just as problematic as he is. And rather than just suspending them and, you know, pushing them out, ostracizing, the school sent them to a wonderfully skilled mediator who I just totally fell in love with this guy, sat them down, made them talk to each other, and then he had them go out and do community service. Together. Yeah. And the two of them now are friends. And it was a really beautiful story. The other son had called my son Jewy, mm -hmm. and my son got him in a headlock. My son is Jewish. And our first reaction as parents, I mean, here's an example right here, was to say, oh, anti-Semites, oh, terrible. What terrible parents, how they're raising their kids. The minute we met these parents... They look completely exhausted. You know, you could tell they were really good parents trying as hard as they could mm -hmm. to hold on to their jobs and deal with a child who was presenting them challenges that they could barely manage. So we ended up talking, you know, exchanging notes about therapists and rather than judging them immediately. And that's what I guess I'm saying schools yeah. should do. I wish they would do. And it's interesting that you say the time, the time for them, the priority. Yeah. It makes an amazing to hear that a school would send these two boys who'd been in an altercation to a mediator. And that, it I was never beautiful. heard of this. It was before. beautiful. It was such a wonderful a surprise. School. Yeah. It's fabulous. Yeah. There are so many existent resources out there. Right. And yet it's the connections yeah. and the time and the awareness that they're out there. And is someone in the counseling office at the school? going to take the time and see the situation as the potential for bringing these kids together and educating both of them, rather than the quick thing is, you're out the door. I'm really touched by your description of these parents who exhausted, and we're all trying to do the best we can. Right. There's so many challenges to our own sanity and our sense of calm, 
And we have to keep trying. But it would be nice if the institutions that are educating our kids were on our side. It sure would, yeah. Because the first reaction just seems so common to judge, you know, to immediately assume the worst. Oh, he's got lazy parents, you know, and the the parents aren't doing their... Most parents, I think, really love their kids. Yes, And are trying within the best of their abilities Mm -hmm. and their personalities and psychologies to do some good. So... If you meet people with a certain amount of belief in their essential goodwill, I think it goes a long way. I know that there are lots of parents out there who have kids of this age and younger who are thinking, will this kid ever be independent and be able to manage his own life enough to continue his education in college? Have you thought about this? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're just kind of hoping that his brain catches up with the challenges put on it. Mm -hmm. My husband and I both went to good colleges, but we're getting okay with the idea that he might be in a community college, he might do something alternative for a while. We encourage him to work hard at school. He seems to be working harder as the years go by. He knows that we have high expectations, we have high values, but I think we're trying not to pressure him beyond his abilities. Is he currently taking meds? No, he's not. So he's managing this on his own? Yeah, he took a bunch of neurofeedback. He took many sessions of neurofeedback, and I think that that actually helped. I also think it's helped for him to just mature much more. So Yeah, um, maturity is a good, and, and there's no timetable for it. You can't, right. you, you, you can't rush it, you can't hurry it up. A friend of mine said, I mean, because they still, my children still fight mm-hmm. a good amount, as I did with my siblings when I was their age. Mm-hmm. And a friend of mine told me something very wise, which is, you probably aren't going to be able to change them. But for now, for these years, you're going to have to manage this and just separate them, find logistical things that work. So you don't leave them alone in the house together. Mm-hmm. So that's just what we have to do. And would you say in terms of your self-assessment that you're a calmer mother now? There's no doubt in my mind that I'm a calmer mother. I meditate these days. But I think the neurofeedback actually did help me to be calm. And just focusing on the need to be calm helped. I actually feel calmer in my body when they fight. Most of the time, I'm able to speak to them in a low voice, not immediately start yelling. So for me, that's actually been the greatest gift of this book. Well, you know, we say you don't need to be perfect. We're just looking for progress, right? not perfection. Yeah. Great. My guest today has been Catherine Ellison, and her book is Buzz, A Year of Paying Attention. Kathy, before we say goodbye, I'd like to know if there's any resources like your own website where people could find out more about you and this very complex problem of finding resources for kids with ADD and ADHD. Sure. I would recommend that people look on my website, www.katherineellison.com, for a number of articles that I've written, including a feature about dolphin therapy and whether you should treat ADHD with marijuana. Probably not. And I'll try to keep updating it with articles that would explain if there's any great hope out there other than just trying to stay calm. (laughs) Thank you so much for spending time with us, and I wish you all the best of luck with this book. I think it's going to be speaking to the hearts of a lot of parents. Thank you very much. This is Annie Fox for Family Confidential. Find out more about my work with tweens, teens, and parents by checking out AnnieFox.com. And tune in next time when my guest, Sean Buvalo, will talk about his book, Daddy Teller, How to Be a Hero to Your Kids and Teach Them What's Really Important by Telling Them One Simple Story at a Time. Till then, happy parenting! Happy parenting!